Okay. So we will do a recap of what we were talking about last time. So I did a quick refresher of computer architecture concepts. This is the picture to keep in mind as we go along. Okay. So this is uh, these are the main components of a typical PC. Okay. So four key components. The CPU. This is where the code, the process actually executes its code. Main memory or RAM. This is where the process actually is resident in memory, core, data, and so on. Okay. I/O peripherals of various sort, okay. and uh, the system bus that interconnects all of them. Okay. That's what is used by the CPU to fetch data or instructions from memory. That's what I/O devices use uh, when they're reading or writing directly from memory and so on. Okay. So four key components, something to keep in mind. We'll come back to this as we go along. Okay. I also mentioned. Uh, last time, a variety of hardware features uh, that go beyond that big basic picture I just showed you. And we had a discussion of why some of those features are in the hardware uh, uh, or supported by the CPU at all. How do they make the job of the operating system easier in some sense? Okay, so I won't go through all of the details, just wanted to remind you of we talked about user and kernel mode, uh, which allows. Uh, the CPU to ensure that sensitive or privileged instructions are only executed by the kernel. Okay. We talked about base and limit registers, which allows the hardware to enforce that any process does not have access to the memory that is assigned to some other process. Okay. I talked about traps and interrupts, and I said the hardware feature that's in there, in the, supported by the CPU to make uh, the implementation of traps and interrupts efficient a trap vector essentially a table that allows you to index the trap or the interrupt number id and figure out where the trap handler is okay, that's the exception handler and you can just index it and directly go there and start executing okay i talked about various forms of io synchronous io asynchronous io whether io is blocking or non blocking also mentioned memory mapped io all concepts will come back again uh, later on in course, just something to keep in mind. We talked about timers that you can use to uh, implement sleeps in user programs, implement scheduling. I briefly talked about atomic instructions that are supported by the CPU, which we'll use for synchronization. When we talk about locks and monitors and uh, semaphores, I will come back to this. We will see how those instructions are actually used okay, to implement uh, locks and so on. And then I did not talk about virtual memory, uh, but just want to say a few words. So there's virtual memory also supported by the OS. It's an illusion that gives you essentially, uh, uh, the OS gives you an illusion of essentially having infinite RAM. Okay, you're not limited by the size of RAM in what processes do. And uh, the hardware features that you have to make it more efficient are TLBs, translation, look as I block. It's a form of a cache. Okay, again, we will come back to TLBs. When we do virtual memory. Okay, there's a quick recap. What we are going to do today is talk a little bit more about system calls. Okay, and then I'm going to talk about uh, four different ways to architecturally, four different ways to design an operating system kernel. Okay, so we'll just look at that as well. Class exercises disappear. It's here. Okay. All right. So before we proceed, I thought it's good to do a quick in-class exercise that draws upon concepts we talked about in lecture one and two. Okay. So uh, it's also just a fun exercise. So uh, you probably, unless you've been not paying any attention, you know that a new iPhone has been announced. A new version of iOS has been announced. So I figured it's instructive to go look at couple of features that were announced as part of all of these uh, uh, media frenzy. And from a worst standpoint, try to have a discussion of what, why they were put in, what does it give us, uh, etc. Yes. So first feature that uh, Apple seems to be promoting is this new iPhone is going to be 64-bit. Okay. And the uh, operating system clearly is now also 64-bit. So I wanted to 
put this up for discussion and said what might have prompted Apple to go from 32 bit to 64 bit. So what does it buy you? You have a phone now, it's a 64 bit phone. Where does it? Greater RAM capability. Okay, then you will have more RAM capability for sure. So first you would ask the question, what does 64 bit give you? Yeah, I assume you know what 64 bit means first of all. Okay, it all means that you can address uh, memory that's 2 to the power 64 memory addresses can be 64. Your, uh, all of your uh, math computations can be done in 64 bit. Integers are represented as 64 bit words uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, desktop, laptop made this transition years ago. Right. Now, uh, here we are saying we're going to have a 64 bit phone. What do you think of this feature? Why does it, how does it change your life? Any thoughts on pros, cons, benefits? Do you care? Should you care? Uh, a lot of programs for desktop and laptops are designed specifically for 64 bit, and if an iPhone wanted to adapt one of those programs, it could easily do so. Okay, that's a good point. So, point being made is a uh, lot of pro applications that are written for desktops actually are 64 bit compiled for 64 bit. And if you wanted to have one platform that ran them all, then this is a natural transition. A good point, except that you cannot really run as of today any desktop applications on your phone. Yes, you have to basically it's a completely different API. So you should ask what the 64 bit give you. It allows you to address a much larger RAM. Okay, so if you have servers where you have server applications running, you can have hundreds of gigabytes of RAM and you are able to address them. Okay. On a phone, you are getting barely a gig. Okay, so 64-bit addressing is not going to buy you anything. Okay, that's one point. The other thing that 64-bit gives you is you can actually do complex math calculations that are all 64-bit. You know, I don't know who runs complex math applications on the phone. So, Probably not useful from that perspective either. Okay, so any Sounds thoughts? good in marketing when you're trying to sell your phone. Okay, good marketing feature. So about the only benefit I could think of. Something that others have not done. Okay, so I still, we can say there's a question mark as to do you really need it? I'm sure 99% of people who use their phones don't really need it or might even care that you are 64 bit on your phone. But that's a feature they put in and you have to scratch your head a little bit to understand what does it do for you. At this point, not much help. Other feature, yeah, so they have put in a coprocessor on the phone. What that means is for a CPU that you have, there's another CPU that is somewhat more specialized that the main CPU can offload its tasks to. So they have an A7 processor, that's an ARM processor. And there's a it now comes with a coprocessor. So the CPU can offload in this case, this coprocessor is going to actually do processing of sensor data. Okay? Uh, whether it's camera or accelerometer or GPS, you can offload all of that processing to the coprocessor. And uh, now you have two of these, okay? a main processor and a coprocessor. So let's ask the question, why have a coprocessor, what does it do for you? Okay, does it actually benefit you, the user? Definitely, it should process faster. You have two of these now, a main processor and a coprocessor. So, coprocessor could be doing something in parallel to the main processor. So, you may get a performance boost. Okay. So, you can answer your calls faster. Yes. Do you think you need some 
So another point being made is if you have a coprocessor do some specialized things, you can offload it and you don't have to use the power of the main processor. Okay. That is indeed an advantage. So uh, the one of the reasons they put the coprocessor is as the main processor increases in its capabilities, it also needs more power okay, because it is more capable. Okay, so you need more power to power the processor. Okay, more power essentially means, sort of from a phone perspective, it means reduced battery life. So your battery is, is going to have to supply more power, it's going to impact your battery life. Okay? So from a design standpoint, adding a smaller coprocessor that is more specialized, and probably because it's more specialized, it's smaller and more energy efficient, makes sense. Okay? Because if you do most of your specialized tasks on the coprocessor, you don't have to run the main processor as much. That means you can reduce your overall power consumption. Okay. So from your user standpoint, if rather than saying that this main processor has now more capabilities and what they will not tell you is as a result your reduced battery life, they've actually made a good design decision, which is to introduce this additional coprocessor, do the specialized task in a more energy efficient manner, save on battery life. Okay. So you are not sacrificing battery life by simply making the main processor more capable. Okay, that would have been a design trade-off. Do you actually have a more beefier processor but reduce battery life? They decided they wanted to have a better processor but not sacrifice battery life. This is the only way to have done that in a smart way. Okay. So this does make sense from a system design standpoint, okay, if you want to achieve these conflicting goals. Okay, so I think that this one, I think although most people will not again care about the coprocessor itself, it will actually enable a better experience for users because you'll get stronger battery life, at least today than it was. Yes, I would say this one is actually a good design decision from a system standpoint. Any comments on this? Okay. The bonus question is who is planning to camp out on the out of the Apple store three days in advance to buy a phone. No one. That's actually smart. <laughs> Time is better spent reading the worst textbook, probably. Okay, so that's uh, just to give you a sense of uh, hardware design decisions, OS implications, what makes sense, and so on. I mean, these are, I thought this was somewhat relevant to the first two lectures. Let's move on, we'll talk, come back to system calls now. Okay. So I introduced system calls last time. Okay. Remember I said uh, the reason, so it's first of all the interface exported by the OS kernel. The reason you have them is only the OS is uh, trusted enough to execute certain privileged sensitive instructions. So if the application or a process wants to do something that's privileged, it has to ask the OS to do it for you and it does this via a system call. Okay. So it's the programming interface to services provided by the OS. Okay. And typically what you do okay, as an application designer, you don't program at the system call level. Okay. You program at a higher level. Typically you have APIs that you program to. The most common APIs are you write Java code, that's the JVM, okay, the Java API. Okay, you write to the JVM. Okay, if it is Unix code or Linux code, you use the POSIX API. <coughs> And if it's Windows code, you may use Win32 or Win64 in there. So that is what you write your application programs to. Okay. Now what the application programs would do is invoke those APIs. Those APIs may typically be a library or a runtime. Okay. In case of JVM, it's a runtime. So the APIs in turn will actually be written to the system call interface that the underlying platform will provide for you. Okay. So user programs typically are not directly going to access system call. You can, of course, write programs that directly invoke the system call, but you don't do that. You typically program uh, to some, one of these higher level APIs. Okay, so one question is why use these APIs rather than directly programming to a system call interface? Okay. It is easier, more convenient. Um, it provides compatibility. Okay, it does provide compatibility. Okay. If you use uh, write a program to Java API, it runs on any JVM regardless of the underlying platform. So more portable, 
if you are programmed, let's say, to a Windows API, that code will not run on Linux or Unix, for example. That's true. Yep. So the intent of some of these should make it more readable. Okay, it is more readable. Um, yes, sort of. So it is always write readable code. The higher level APIs might be a little easier to understand. Okay, so all of what was said was indeed true. Okay, higher level APIs are higher level for a purpose. They are going to abstract some of the lower level details for you. They will provide easier, more convenient to use methods, functions, interfaces. Okay, so that's, uh, they are sometimes portable. POSIX code may need to be recompiled, but if it's a POSIX interface that's supported and WA, they could run on multiple platforms. Same is true of Java APIs not true of Win32, but nevertheless, Win32 API is much more richer than richer in terms of uh, ease of use and convenience than the underlying system part. Okay. So this is what happens when you actually execute your code. Okay. This is a user program. It's actually a C program. It could well have been a Java program. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So in this case, you use the C interface, okay, the C library interface to do IO. You are doing printf. It's going to print a string on the screen. So this is what the user has, uh, <coughs> the application programmer has written. So when this code executes, printf is actually going to go to the C library to execute C. If the C library implements the printf method function, okay. what, this, what the implementation of printf in the C library in turn is going to do is invoke a system call. Okay. In this case, printf, as you can see, is an IO function. Okay, I said last time I/O is privileged, so you cannot directly do I/O. You have to ask the OS to do I/O. So the implementation of printf in the C library will actually invoke the right system call and ask the OS to do I/O for this program or the process. Okay, so in this case, you will still just uh, invoke the right system call if you implement it in Unix, for instance, and then the OS will actually go and do whatever the user has asked. Okay, so that's a picture to keep in mind. So you will have your, if you have Java code, this is your Java source code. This will be the JVM and the JVM is making system calls on behalf of the user uh, program. Okay, so typically what we need to understand is any method was going to have any function, some parameters, some return values. Okay, so I won't go into the details. This is a read file method that Win32 exposes. No need to go into the details of all of the parameters that are mentioned here, just uh, for your convenience. But you don't really need to know that. What you do need to know is whether it's a, a, a API that's at a, designed for the user or it's a system call, you are going to have to pass parameters back and forth and the system call or the API method may also return some value. Okay. So the only question for us is how does all of that happen? So to understand that, we have to go back to the implementation of system calls. Okay, how are system calls implemented? I briefly alluded to this last time when I was talking about traps and you changing from user mode to kernel mode. Let's look at that for a few more minutes in some more detail. Okay, so the way typically operating systems will implement system calls is they will have a sort of a set of them, okay, tens or hundreds of them, and they are numbered. Every system call gets a unique ID, a number, an integer. Okay. And the system call interface is going to maintain a table that's indexed according to this number. This is like the trap vector. Okay. So you will have a table, let's say this is called 0, 1, 2, 3, so on. And that is basically the table will have an address. So if this system call is actually invoked, system call 0, this is the address in the OS kernel that you need to go to to execute. So that's where the function for the system call implementation rather resides. Okay. From a user standpoint, you don't actually evoke system calls by numbers. They're given names. Okay. The names are actually mapped out to the function. This could be the read call, this could be the write call, and so on. So then you have you actually invoke the consumable readable versions of the system calls. They get mapped onto their ID. The ID tells the OS where does the system call reside in kernel memory, it will then go there and execute. 
not unlike what is done for tau vector. Now, basically, from a uh, uh, library designer standpoint, you don't really need to know how this is internally implemented. Okay, we are going to look at it because we are interested in OS design. But if you're writing to system call interfaces, you don't really need to know. You just need to know what does the system call do, what parameters does it take, what return values does it give back to you. Okay, and then you can just invoke it and uh, it's just like invoking any other function. Okay. So now we, what we will do is just look inside <coughs> how all this works. I mentioned this last time. Okay, the same picture is here, slightly different system call this time. Okay, here the user application or process wants to open a file. Okay. So depending on whether this is written to the C library or the JVM, you are going to invoke a user level method, whether it's f open or you just call file open in Java. Okay. Then the library is going to in turn actually trigger a system call. In this case, it's the open system call. Okay. Now this is going to cause a switch okay, in the mode bit okay, because you are invoking a system call. So you are going to basically suspend the execution of that process, start invoking the kernel, okay, switch to kernel mode. Okay, and then uh, kernel mode sees what system call has been invoked. Okay, first it is going to index this table that I just showed you and say this is what's number, whatever number it is, it's going to look at that. That's going to give you the memory address and you jump to the implement. This is the implementation of open okay, inside the kernel. Okay, you jump here and then you actually execute this code. Okay, and then you will have to return some value. The return value is generated you will switch back from the kernel to user mode, resume execution of the process, return those values. Okay. Not very different from what I showed last time, just a little more detail. Okay, now what we are going to ask is how are parameters passed from the user application to the kernel and how are the return values sent back. Okay. Now you probably know what happens when you invoke a function within your user process function has some parameters, you pop, uh, push those parameters onto a stack and then you jump to the function start executing and the, fun the code of that function is going to take those parameters and uh, do whatever the function needs to do or the method needs to do. Okay, that's how you implement, a or not implement, execute a function in user code. In this case, we are at we are invoking a function but in a different address space. The user process is, is invoking a function but that function resides in the kernel address space. Okay? The kernel is a distinct process as far than the user code. Okay? But we still need to pass parameters back and forth. So we are passing parameters from one address space to another. Okay? It's almost like having one uh, process invoke a function in another process. Okay? And you still need to pass parameters. Okay, so it's worthwhile asking how is that done. Is the question clear? What I'm saying here. So simply asking how are you going to, how is the user process going to pass on whatever parameters the system call needs to the kernel process. Okay, so how would we do that? What methods would you think of if you are tasked to write this over? How do you normally pass parameters? You must have learned something about parameters and parameter pass, pass by value, pass by reference, people to right? What do we need to do? Okay, there's the kernel process, there's the user process. We need to pass some information from one to another. So how would we do that? In this case, information happens to be parameters to the system call. Okay. It's a good guess. You have to use memory. So you have to put the parameter somewhere and tell the OS it's there, go pick it up from there. Okay. Not very difficult concept. Okay. So question is how, which, what kind of information? Okay, that can be shared between the user process and uh, the kernel. 
So this rule has to be shared. So it's going to be using a pointer. Uh, you could think of using a pointer. I don't know if most of you know what pointers are. Okay, pointers are ad memory addresses. But do remember that pointers are specific to user process. Okay, the kernel needs to interpret what pointer a user process has passed to. Okay, somewhat complicated can be done, okay, but uh, we, are, we are on the right track. So we will be seeing more later when we get them into the applications. Okay, we put them in a register. Okay, simplest method is register shared memory. Okay, you stick the parameter into a register and tell the OS it's in register one. Go pick it up from there. Okay, straightforward approach. Very fast because registers are fast regions of memory. It's the advantage of passing parameters into registers. Of course, there might be a disadvantage of using registers to pass parameters. We have a limited number. Okay, so if you wanted to pass lots of parameters, unless you have lots of registers, you can't do it. Registers also are sort of one word inside, or maybe an integer or so inside. So if you want to pass a string, you're out of luck. You can't put a long string into a register. The register cannot hold it. Okay, so unless you're passing integers or you're passing small number of parameters that fit in registers, this is a fine technique to use. Okay, so, so let's say that's our preferred approach. Whenever possible, stick the parameter into a register, ask for kernel to pick it up. Okay. What if you couldn't? Then what would you do? Where else could you put it? Typically, cannot directly muck around with the cache. It's handled by the hardware. Okay, the only thing you can touch in the memory hierarchy are registers. And we talked about memory hierarchy last time. Heap, RAM. Okay, heap, RAM. Okay, so you can, if you can't put it in register, you have to put it in main memory. Okay, and tell the OS, just go pick it up from somewhere. Okay, so that's really what you can do. It's as like you can see, not a hard concept. We're just going to think for a minute. So simplest is you pass parameters in registers. If you cannot do that, that would be fast. But if you cannot do that because there are too many parameters or you are passing larger data structures, not just a simple integer, you have to store it in a block of memory. Okay, so and then you basically essentially pass a pointer. Okay, it's somewhat more complicated than directly passing pointers, but that's essentially the concept. Okay. So you store it in a region of memory and you store and you can then just tell the OS to pick it up. It's like a shared region of memory. Okay. You could also, the program could also push it onto its stack, okay, just as it would do when it invokes a function within that address space and tells the OS saying, I pushed it on my stack, go pick it up from my stack. Okay. In this case, the OS has to do a little more work to figure out where does the stack for this process reside and interpret it accordingly. But it's sort of like the same approach as using piece of memory because stack resides in RAM as well. Okay, so you use registers or you use memory. That's how you're going to pass uh, information back and forth. Same is true of return values. Okay. The return value is a simple integer. It's best to just stick it into memory and the OS is going to tell the process saying system call finished. Here is the return value. If the return value is some larger object than our data structure, you have to put it into a piece of memory and then pass it back. Okay. Okay, so that is yes, so question. Sir. So um, each process has its own register, correct? Yes. So when when this process says um, take some parameter from my register, and uh, it's possible that another process will be running while system call is going. Okay, so it's a so good question. There's management going on there, right? Yes. So question being asked is processes manage their own register. So if process A puts some value into register, invokes a system call, okay, can some other process come and overwrite it while the OS is executing? Okay, is the question clear? Okay, so rather than me answering, I'm going to turn it back and say, what do you all think? Well, I think you said that it, it saves it saves the registers and lets another process use its own registers and loads and saves the registers. 
So you have to suspend, when you suspend the process, you are going to have to save the state of the register. That is true. Okay. So the first point I'm going to make is, remember when I said last time, by definition, or not definition, by default, we are going to assume uniprocessor system. One core, one processor. Okay. That means that at any given time, only one thing is executed. Whatever that thing is. Okay. In this case, you have basically, in this flow, you have the OS, uh, not the OS, the user process, and you have the OS kernel. The user process is executing, it decides that it needs to do a system call. It basically invokes a system call that causes a trap. Okay. Trap causes the OS to save its state and so on, and then the kernel process starts running. Okay. Nothing else is running. Just if the US process, uh, user process was running, then you switch to the kernel process. So at this point, the kernel process can take whatever register uh, the parameter was passed in and pick it up from there. See, another process cannot run by default because the kernel is running. It is the one that decides what gets to run. Okay, while it is executing a system call, it's not going to run something else. Okay, so in the uniprocessor case, this scenario will not arise. But if you had a multi-core system, this scenario that was just pointed out would might arise where user process one is running on core one. It has invoked a system call to start running the kernel. That kernel process is also executing on core one. Right? But something else could be running on a second core. Okay? And that could be an independent process that the OS has scheduled and we have to make sure that process doesn't come and muck around with the registers that the first process was using and so on. Okay, so you have to be a bit more careful there. That depends on how registers are allocated to cores and so on. Typically, you will not have that happen if you do the right thing. Okay, so for the, so the simple answer is for the purpose of this class, because we said uni processor, this case is not even going to arise. That the register somehow got trampled because the only thing that will run were the user process that made the call and the kernel process. And there's nothing else that can run in between. Any other questions here? Okay, so I showed a simplified version of this picture. I'm going to just show you again. These are just examples of system calls. There are literally dozens and dozens of them for the new platform. This uh, one just shows different categories. So there are calls to do process management, okay, create processes, delete processes, manage them in some way. There is a whole set of system calls to do file manipulation or I.O. of different flavors. Okay. Typically, they happen to be file I.O., but you can do other I.O. as well using system calls. There are device manipulation, okay, where you can actually talk to hardware devices. You can do a sort of a maintenance type system calls that says set a timer, sleep, get a process ID, all of that kind of stuff. There are calls that allow you to do inter-process communication that explicitly send messages back and forth between processes running on the same machine. There are calls to do that. There are calls for security and uh, protection and so on. Okay. Whole slew of them. Okay. This just shows you the various names. You are not expected to remember them. This is just to give you a flavor of what kind of system calls exist. Okay. Maybe the next lab might involve some system calls. At that point, you may actually use some of them. Okay. You don't really need to know all of them. Okay, any questions here? Okay, so that's all I have to say on system calls. I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, the four architectures for designing OS kernels that I had promised you. Okay. So when you do uh, think about how to design an OS kernel, first thing you have to think is architecturally, what does it look like? Okay. The kernel is a large piece of software. Okay, from an architectural standpoint, what might be a few different ways of thinking about how you go about structuring whatever is inside the kernel. Okay. So this is a picture of what a Unix-like kernel looks like. Okay. The thing between the gray bars is the kernel itself. What is below the gray bar are hardware devices. So remember, the OS kernel runs on hardware, and then it provides an abstraction to a user process. So there are things that run on top of the kernel. Those are user processes. What is below the kernel is the hardware on the machine. Okay. So basically, at the lowest level in the kernel is the kernel interface to the hardware. This is basically how device drivers 
talk to the hardware device. The top layer of the kernel is a system call interface. This is how everything that runs on top actually interacts with the OS whenever it needs to. Okay. And what is in between are all the components of your kernel itself. Okay. So a kernel is a protected part of the OS that runs in ker kernel mode. Okay. That's essentially the crux of what an OS is. Okay. That's not all of it, but that's more sort of the most important part of the OS is the kernel. So it maintains critical data structures that are needed for process management, memory management, I.O. management, communication, all of those things. There are data structures stored there. And then there are services. Okay, and we have this whole slew of them. We are going to dig deeper into a whole bunch of them in this course. Okay. Now this picture shows you what is referred to as a monolithic kernel. Okay. It's one large blob of code. It has lots of different functions, but it executes as one large piece. Think of it as a process, uh, which is the kernel, and it has all of those functions embedded in it. Okay? And it exposes a system call interface. This is how Unix kernels look like. Okay? They are referred to as monolithic kernels, this one big blob of code. Okay, so now you can look at some other platforms. Okay. This is OS X, the kernel that runs actually on Macs. Somewhat similar kernel also runs on phones that Apple produces. And you will see that when they say OS, they actually mean more than the kernel. Okay. This is the picture that I pulled from a book uh, that describes the OS X architecture. Okay. This is the hardware, same picture as previous and that's everything about that we know thing is essentially the user application. So what we are calling the kernel is essentially only this piece, okay, this piece. Okay. So this is basically the kernel in Mac OS. But when Apple refers to OS X, they actually mean the kernel and some important system services. And here are some of them. Okay. Many of them are GUI based, but some of them do other things as well. Okay. So, so we have to distinguish when we say OS, are we talking about the OS kernel or are we talking about the OS kernel and all of the services that the OS provides? Some of which are not inside the kernel. You see that these are OS services, but they reside outside the kernel. They are system services. They may run as privileged processes or demons or system or what are those are system services. Okay. So in this class, when I say OS, we really mean the OS kernel. Okay. But when you may hear the term OS elsewhere, you have to keep in mind that they are actually referring not just to the kernel, but maybe a slew of system services that the OS provides to user applications. Okay, just wanted to make that distinction clear between the kernel and what an OS means. Okay. Same is true of Windows. Okay. So that's a picture of Windows 8 architecture. So one we the kernel that we are going to be interested in is just this piece of what Microsoft calls Windows OS. Okay. And you'll see there are a whole bunch of other services that are provided. There are uh, APIs to do uh, graphical user interface stuff. There is, uh, they even put Internet Explorer as a system service. I think, I think that's a user process or application, not a OS service, but be that as it may, uh, they refer to it as a system service. There's Win32 API here, whole bunch of other system services. Okay. So again, from our perspective, when we say OS in this class, we only mean this piece. The OS platform itself includes lots of other things. So we are actually not going to study anything that sort of resides on top of the kernel as far as this class is concerned. We are only going to look at the design of the kernel itself. Okay, there is a whole bunch of interesting things there, but not part of this course. Okay, clear? Okay, so monolithic kernels is one way to design your kernel where you take all of the code for the kernel run it as the kernel process. Okay. Here's another way to design it. Okay. This has a little more structure. Okay. This is referred to as a layered design. Okay. So is there, rather than thinking of the OS as one big piece, we are going to think of it as a set of components. Okay. So OS consists of multiple components. Each component has a certain functionality associated with it. In a layered design, okay, the components has a very specific structure. 
the structure says that the components are layered one on top of another therefore they are stacked okay? and each component each layer can only interact with the layer below it and the layer above it but not to other layers okay, so if you take any layer okay, i or n that layer can only talk directly in terms of <coughs> calling functions or what not to the layer above it and the layer below it okay. so you cannot actually directly call a function two layers below you have to actually invoke something in the layer below you and have it indirectly invoke some methods or functions in layer below it okay, so you cannot directly call things two layers above either so layer design is basically going to structure the os as a set of components that are stacked or layered and they impose a restriction on what each layer who each layer can talk to okay, only the layer above and the layer below a okay, different way of designing your OS okay, rather than thinking of it as one large process that has all of the functions it take the functions partition them into layers. so you can ask <coughs> what are the, why do this what are the pros and cons of doing this okay. first advantage is you got modularity okay. each layer is essentially now as its own thing you can modify it independently of other layers so long as the interface it exposes to the layers below and above don't change Nothing needs to change in other layers if you make a change to them. Okay, so it provides much easier sort of uh, easier design, easier to debug, easier to uh, think about, and so on. Okay. Now disadvantage here is that you are restricted in who, which layers can talk to each other layer. Each layer can talk to at most two layers. So if you wanted to design an OS component that needs to talk to four different other OS components, you'll have to think of creative ways because in this you are sort of restricted only talking to two. So the others you want to communicate with, you will have to go through these two and then have them talk to them. Okay? So it imposes a certain restriction which may or may not be easy to deal with because OS kernel is a large complex piece of software. Can you design every uh, uh, entity in the kernel uh, such that it can only talk to two other entities. Is that a reasonable restriction? Okay. In many cases the answer is no, okay, but this is one way of thinking about layer design. Okay. Now having said this, I am going to say that no real operating system actually uses a full layer design today. Okay. But there is one piece of the OS kernel that actually uses layer design and that's uh, the case for every OS kernel out there and that piece is the networking component. Okay, rather than designing the entire OS kernel this way, the network sub, uh, component of the uh, OS actually uses layer design because the network component typically implements TCP IP which if you have taken any class in networking or if you have any exposure to, you will know, know something about the network stack, the protocol stack. The protocol stack is by definition layered. You have the physical layer and the MAC layer and the network layer and the transport layer. So the right way to implement it in the kernel is to adopt a layered design. Okay. So the thing to keep in mind is layered design is not quite uh, used for the, uh, for the entire kernel. It is only used for implementing the network part of the kernel, the networking part of the kernel, or the part that implements networking for you. Okay, typically that means implementing the TCP IP stack. Okay, people here taken networking class 463. Okay. So if you haven't taken it, don't worry about it. Just all you need to know is you don't use this in a general way. Okay, only for very specific purposes. Okay. Here's yet another architecture for designing OS kernel. Okay, this is referred to as a micro kernel architecture. Okay, the microkernel philosophy says essentially the OS is a very complex beast, the kernel that is. So rather than making it large and complex, let's make it small and efficient and fast. Okay. And the way you will do this is what you will put in what we call the kernel is going to be a very small base set of functionality. This is really what is at the crux of what the kernel should do. And essentially, it happens to be some form of protection and allowing communication. Okay. Everything else that you actually think of as part of the kernel, you are going to implement, but not inside the microkernel. You will implement them as 
traditional user processes. Right? Your file system is going to be user process. It's going to run like a user process just as your browser. Okay? Memory management, also user process. Okay? Paging and so on. Networking, user process. Okay? So you pull every, pretty much most of what is inside the kernel, you pull it out, implement them as user processes. Okay? So maybe they are privileged user processes, but nevertheless, they don't run in the kernel address space. What's in the, in the kernel address space is a very small set of functionality. Okay, this is why it's referred to as a micro kernel. It's a small kernel. It only pro provides very basic features. Anything that else that the OS needs to do or the kernel needs to do really is not inside the micro kernel, but it's run as user process. Okay. Now you can ask the question, what does this buy? Why do it this way? What did we gain? What might we have lost? So if you are to write your OS kernel as a micro kernel. Anybody think of any advantages of micro kernel? Yes. I use some modularity. So high degree of modularity. Okay. User process. So if you want to change the file system, it's its own process. You can modify it independent. You don't even need to look at the code for the networking or the paging, for instance. You just look at that process code. Otherwise, if you had to go and let's say modify a monolithic kernel, you, know, you may have to think about the entire 10 million lines of code that may be in there and think about if I modify this phase, what might it do to all of the rest of the kernel? Here, if you want to modify the file system, you only look at this piece because the rest of them are not even part of that process. Okay, it's just implemented as its own thing. Okay, so long as it uses the same interface to interact with the rest, you don't need to do anything else. Okay, so high degree of modularity. Okay, primary advantage of the micro kernel. You can actually implement it with uh, much more ease than you would do with a monolithic kernel. If you basically ask the OS designer, go change the networking support and implement this extra feature in there, they don't need to even worry about all of the rest of this code. Only look at that one and just recompile it and you're done. Okay. Modularity, indeed, a very important advantage. Any, any others? So you said there is low overhead and worse security. Okay, I will speak to that, but there's another hand somewhere. Somebody else raised the hand. Okay, so it is true that there is an issue with overhead and an issue with security, but it's not the way you actually put it. It's somewhat different. Uh, first problem, so. So security is actually not a disadvantage, but somewhat of an advantage here. Okay. Because each process or each system service runs as its own process, you may actually get better security, not worse security. Okay. Because if there is a bug here, there's some malicious code okay, that you cannot actually enter, uh, that malicious code cannot enter from here and then muck around with that part. Because these are independent processes, you get the benefit of memory protection and all of that. If everything was one blob of code, you find some vulnerability somewhere, you can use that to exploit some other vulnerability in the kernel elsewhere. Here, all of those functions are in different places, they're in different user processes. So if you find a vulnerability in this subsystem, you can only exploit other things in this subsystem. It's not as easy to go and muck around with something else. Okay? So an advantage of this architecture, because we have pulled these components have made them their own separate entities is these entities are only talking to one another through the kernel. Okay? And thereby you cannot actually uh, do things that you could have done in terms of exploiting vulnerabilities and so on in a monolithic kernel. Okay? Much harder to do. So it offers better uh, security okay, than a monolithic kernel. Okay? I did want to mention one thing I forgot. Is this pro these entities do need to communicate with one another. 
So the way this communication is going to happen is you are going to go through the microkernel. So the base feature that your microkernel provides you is com uh, communication between other system services. Okay, that's an important function of what is still there in the microkernel. Okay, so if your file system needs to talk to, uh, let's say, uh, a memory subsystem in order to read some data into memory, you are going to essentially go through the microkernel and have these entities talk to each other. Okay. Now, this should tell you something about uh, efficiency of this architecture. Does it say anything? So if these processes have to talk to one another and use the kernel to do to enable that communication, then you are going to lose some benefits in terms of efficiency. Because every time this component A has to talk to component B, it has to actually make a call to the microkernel and the microkernel is going to then throw a sort of inter uh, pass on whatever information needed to be passed on to that other component. So there's a high degree of overhead because in a monolithic kernel, all of these components are part of the same kernel process. So if component A had to interact with component B, you simply make a function call. This is how you write your code. Okay, you, if you have multiple classes or object, method A can call method B. Okay, that's just a function call inside your code. Function calls are very efficient. In this case, if component A has to interact with component B, it has to send a message to the kernel. Maybe an order of magnitude more overhead to actually send a message because you know this process you're going to trap to the kernel, the kernel is going to take the message, then it's going to pass it on here, then this process is going to start running. Okay. So the scheduling overhead is overhead of passing information back and forth. Okay. So efficiency is the biggest disadvantage of microkernels. Okay. They are a lot less efficient. They do have advantages, modularity being one, better security being another. But efficiency is not where you are going to actually see any benefits. In fact, it is going to be significantly worse than all of the architectures I talked about. Okay. So mediocre performance. Okay, now there are many, many microkernels that were designed okay, as part of research projects. Some of these, so none of them uh, actually are in full-fledged commercial use today. So we basically came up with these ideas and then explored them. Okay, now, what happened eventually was some of these ideas did get adopted by a few commercial operating systems, but in the end, nothing was actually quite successful. Okay? And uh, uh, just to give you a little more history, both Windows and uh, OS X okay, essentially uh, at one point used a microkernel architecture. Okay, Original Windows uh, NT, Some, a kernel that Windows had put out many many years ago, employed a microkernel architecture. Okay. And the reason for this uh, the architecture change was there was this project called the MAP project. It was a research project at CNU. Okay, that's where this microkernel idea was actually explored in some depth. Uh, the key OS designer for MAP was then employed by Microsoft and asked to lead the design of Windows. So he brought some of his team with him and they decided that this is the way they were going to go with the Windows NT. Windows NT was a switch from Windows 3.1 which didn't have much of the modern OS feature so they wanted a more modern platform. Okay. So they actually designed the original Windows NT with a microkernel architecture. So it got all of those advantages that I just mentioned, but it was painfully slow. So users didn't like it because it took forever to do things that would run very quickly on the previous generation of Windows. So now you are st you've just put out a product that has this kind of architecture and your customers say, I don't really like it, it's far too slow. Okay, so what could you do? Or what would you do? the next revision of it, let's say. Okay. So you say, why is it inefficient? There is far too much communication going back and forth that's slowing things down. 
So what you don't want to somehow you want to avoid it. How would you avoid it? Yes. Okay, so you want them to directly communicate. You don't want them to go through the server. The way you are going to directly communicate is you are going to take that piece and stick it back into the server. Okay, so these two pieces talk to one another a lot and that's moving things down. You just pull them back here and now they talk to one another as function calls. Which is invoke function. Function calls are fast. You don't need to send messages back and forth. Okay. So this is exactly what happened. So they said, how do we make it fast? We cannot actually put that outside the kernel. That's going to kill performance. So we are going to start pulling some pieces back. So I said this piece is important, let's put it back, that other piece is important. But some other pieces may not have impacted performance, so we are going to leave it out. So you start now thinking, you know, the kernel start looking like a hybrid architecture, a part of it is monolithic, because you pulled some pieces back, and part of it still looks like a micro kernel. Okay. So this is essentially what happened to Windows, they made it faster by just saying, let's try to basically make it faster, so they started pulling things back. Now it turns out that OS X is also based on Mars. In fact, it still is today. Okay, if you actually look at the root directory, you will see the Mars kernel is hidden. Okay. So early version of OS X also micro kernel. Okay, it seemed like a good idea in those days. So all OS designers jumped onto that bandwagon. Then they found that performance is really a problem. So they started doing the same thing. And I've started pulling real OS pieces back into the kernel okay, for performance. But some pieces still stay outside. Okay. So even today, uh, all, the, all sort of remnants of Mac and Windows are long gone. Okay, there is no mention of it. But if you look at early books on Windows architecture, you'll see that it was derived from Mac. But OS X actually still has nominally as kernel is actually called the Mac kernel. You'll see that process. Uh, sitting there if you look at the root directory and then they did the same thing they started putting more and more stuff back just for performance reasons. So what you have today for these two big platforms is somewhat of a hybrid a really a hodgepodge of things where you say you start with the micro kernel and then cram some things back for efficiency but leave some things okay, Any questions on this? So I'm going to now talk about a fourth architecture. We talked about monolithic kernel, layered OS design, micro kernel. Okay. The fourth one is a modular module based kernel. Okay. So basically we want to ask the question, what did we learn from these three things? Okay. Well, we started with monolithic, we said it's fast, it's efficient because everything is in one address space. So any component can interact with any other component by simply invoking functions that, that are components exports. Okay, that's fast. But what is the disadvantage is it's one large piece of code. So you make small modifications somewhere, it may have a ripple effect and break something else. Okay. So it's not modular, it's hard to, uh, to modify, hard to debug and so on. Okay. Microkernels try to address some of that. And so did layer design, but they had their disadvantage. Efficiency was a problem, uh, and so on. Okay, although you did gain modular. So the question is, how can you take some of these ideas and design a new architecture that will have these advantages, but not sort of in, uh, inherit any of the disadvantages? And this is where the modular uh, architecture comes in. Most OS kernels have some form of modularity today. Okay. So what you do is you still design each component somewhat independently, okay, just as you did in the micro kernel architecture. Okay, so you are going to design modules. Each module is its own component. Okay, if you actually uh, ever looked at Linux kernel, you know Linux as module. Okay. Same idea is uh, sort of derived from here. So each component is designed like it was designed for a micro kernel in that it designed somewhat independently it has a well-defined API that it is going to export so other modules can talk to it and it will interact with the kernel and other modules 
through the APIs, they will expose to you. Okay. So similar idea as what I showed here. Each piece is sort of when you write the code, you are going to design it somewhat independently. Okay. But you don't want the inefficiencies of the microkernel. Okay. Because you don't want them to uh, go through the kernel every time. So you want to basically not have that uh, as, a, as a downside. So what you are going to do is when you run the kernel, you take all of the modules and you stick them into one address space. Okay, so you write it as if each module is independent, but you run it as if they are all one big piece. Okay. So if you basically what you what actually happens is when your kernel boots up, it starts loading all the modules and they all get loaded into the kernel address space. So when you run the code, okay, it just looks like one large address space. So modules are going to just make function calls. So they are just as efficient as monolithic kernels. Okay. But you impose some modularity on the writing of the kernel by having these modules be their own independent thing. Okay. So most operating systems will have support for a variety of file system. Each is a module. Okay. They will have support for a variety of I.O. devices. Okay. By you, when you have a device driver, each device driver is also a module. When you boot up the kernel, you can only load the modules you need. You don't need to load everything. Okay? If the hardware doesn't have certain devices, you don't load those uh, modules. Okay? So your kernel is not needlessly bloated because it's one large monolithic kernel that has support for everything, regardless of whether the machine needs it or not. You only pull in the pieces you need. Okay? You pull them into one address space for efficiency. But you still try to retain the software engineering benefit of writing these things separately. So this is basically a modular approach. There's a picture of uh, most kernels do this to you. Yeah, so this is Solaris. This is uh, what was designed by Sun now uh, owned by Oracle. Okay, so that's the core kernel, and they basically popularized this model quite a bit many years ago. So each piece okay, is essentially designed as a module that is just going to plug into the main kernel and boot it up. So they all become part of one address space. They don't run as independent processes as they would have in the microkernel architecture. Okay, so now what you're trying to do is make these trade-offs. You want the benefits of the microkernel architecture, but you also want the efficiency benefits of the monolithic architecture. Okay, and this is the way to do it. Okay. Now it's worth asking what have we lost in the process? Did we actually bring all the benefits? Did we lose anything in terms of benefits? Is this clear, first of all, what I just said? Okay. Let me ask the question first. We talked about monolithic, we talked about microkernel. Anything you see we actually lost along the way? Can you mark? best features of the monolithic and the microkernel and put them into the modular approach. Uh, depending on the language you use, you not have any separation at all. It's just a function. Okay, so first point being made is depending on the language, you may not actually have separation. That is indeed true uh, if you choose the wrong language. Most kernels are written in C, fortunately or unfortunately. C does not impose any such separation. Everything goes in C. So, if you return to your kernel in C, which is the de facto language for writing OS kernels, then you will not have that. But you're right. If you actually write your kernel in some other language, you may have that. Any other thoughts on this? Okay, so, what happened to security? Okay, we said we like microkernels because each component is its own process, one process typically cannot touch the memory of other processes, so it gives better security. What about modular kernels? Do they have the same level of security as microkernels? Less? If you are a malicious hacker writing your own virus, do you like microkernels? Or you like modular kernels more than microkernels or less? Less. 
terms of exploiting the list of bugs. Yes. You probably like the modular more better because they're all loaded in the same different memory and they can communicate uh, by function calls that make it easier to exploit them. Yes. So if everything is in the same address space, any bug somewhere allows you to exploit a bug anywhere, or exploit any issue, anything else anywhere else in that address. So once you have a, a way in, you can you basically can do anything you want to the whole kernel. Yeah. So there is no protection between modules; they are all part of the same address space. Okay. So in terms of security, you are essentially at the same level as a monolithic kernel. If you find a vulnerability, the whole kernel is actually exposed. In a microkernel architecture, if you find a vulnerability, only that service is exposed, nothing else. Okay. Okay. So what we have lost along the way is the better security separation you get in the microkernel architecture. Okay. So we gained efficiency because we put everything in the same address space. We retained modularity because we wrote the code as if uh, it was its own thing, it was its own module. But we couldn't actually bring security with it. Okay, so this is the trade-off you make. Okay, you are not going to get everything. You are going to lose something. If you gain something, then lose. So we lost security. It's an acceptable trade-off. Okay, for your users, having a faster machine is probably better. Okay, having a more secure one would also be better. But you can't provide it at the same level of security as microkernel. But as an OS designer, this is much better than writing it as a microkernel. So that's the trade-off you make. Okay, so security is not going to come uh, with modularity okay, or modular OS. So quick recap, I'm going to spend five minutes talking about process management as well today. Okay. So big design decisions, the, so the takeaway here is uh, how, what uh, architecture should we choose to make OS more efficient, more reliable, more extensible. The one thing I forgot to mention actually is that this is also extensible. Okay. The core kernel here exposes the uh, APIs to write a module. So you can go write your own module. You can write your own device driver so long as you write it to that API and you can extend the functionality of the kernel okay, in a very easy way. Okay, so that's also another advantage. So depending on what uh, you want your kernel to do or provide to your users, you are going to pick one of these architectures. And really it's a trade-off. You can't have it all. You have to pick what is more important. Security important, efficiency, modularity, and then make the right design choice. Okay. So this trade-off is going to stay with us throughout this course. And we will see there is always a tension. Okay. You have to see how do you decide what's the right balance. Okay, so, so I'm going to basically switch gears a little bit and introduce the next topic uh, for the next five, ten minutes, and then we will wrap up for the day. The next, now, so we have done uh, a re, uh, sort of a refresher of computer architecture. I did a quick overview of high level OS architecture. Okay, how do you go about designing OS kernel? Okay, with that background, we are ready to jump into the first major component of the course, that is process and thread management. Okay, I'm assuming most of you have heard of processes and threads. What I'm going to do now is essentially define a process formally and then just do some quick introduction. What, uh, what they do and so on. Okay. So what is a process? A process, think of a process as a program in execution. Okay. We want to, first thing we want to do is distinguish between a program and a process. Okay. A program is a piece of code that you write or your compiler generates for you. Okay. A process is that piece of code in execution. It's an executing context of a program. So when you say process, you must think of something that's executing. So if you say program, you should think of a file that's just sitting on disk that contains code. Okay. Two different things. Okay. Distinguish, we should distinguish between them. Process is not the same of a program. A process is an instance of a program in execution. For a given program, you may have multiple processes that are all executing that code. You can start multiple instances of the same program. Okay. Each is its own distinct process. At any given time, your OS may be running tens or hundreds of processes. Okay, you can go and look at some of them. I'm going to show you, uh, if you're on Max, if you go do Activity Monitor, okay, it'll show you all the processes that are running. Okay, these are all the processes that are running on this machine. 
and each is actually a program that's executed. Okay, so that's Microsoft Word, that's Keynote, you see that Java is running, it's PowerPoint. So there is the PowerPoint program, and there is, in this case, there's a process. This is the PowerPoint process that is actually executing that program, okay, two different things. Now, what does a process con uh, include? So, what is in a process? So, that's what's coming next. Okay. So, a process is essentially the dynamic execution context of an executable program. It has all of these things. So, when you say a process, it includes the code for running the program. That's in the code segment. It has static data, variables that you have. You have the heap. Okay. That's where you allocate uh, objects, deallocate objects, and so on. Okay. You also have the stack. This is where function will push their parameters and so on. Okay, and your set of registers. So you have the program counter. Remember, I talked about the program counter. That's the register that says what is the next instruction or the line of the program I'm going to execute okay, in this process. Okay, that's essentially the PC or the program counter. You have other registers such as the stack pointer and so on. That show picture. You have general purpose register that may be storing variables. And you have a whole set of other state, such as uh, files that are open, okay? you are doing network communication, you may have sockets open. All of these things are part of this process. Okay? And that is the process execution state. What is this process doing currently? That's the state of that program. I'll say something about that as well. Okay, so here is pictorially a view. Okay? That was the code, that's your program. Okay? But typically this is C code, so you are not going to execute C code directly, you will convert that to machine code. But for the purposes of this simple example, we will assume you are actually executing that source code as is. So here is what your process looks like. You have the code of that program that now loaded in the process, that's here. Okay, you have the heap, you have the stack. Okay, these are the three segments I showed you last time. Okay. The stack actually has local variables, so this main function has an vari integer variable. That's going to be stored on the stack. Okay, that's it. Heap is if you malloc anything or you basically dynamically allocate objects and so on, they all go on the heap. Okay. This is your program counter. This is a register that is pointing to that part of your program. That is what is going to execute next. What the machine does is it sequentially executes the code. Okay. And then if you have branches or for loops or if statements, you will actually jump, but otherwise you're sequentially. The program counter will be incremented once every time you execute the code, you execute the next instruction and so on. Okay. The stack pointer, the heap pointer tells the OS where is the stack, how large is it, how where is the heap, how large is the heap, and so on. Okay. That is what your process is going to look like. Any questions on this? So there are two things to keep in mind. There's a difference between a program and a process. Process is a program in execution. Okay? Process contains a whole bunch of things in addition to the code for that program. And those include the register, the stack, the heap, set of uh, OS resources such as open files, and the process execution state, which we will talk about next time. Okay? Let's say something about what is happening. So today we'll end here. So continue this next time. Thank you.